So now I'm going to hand you over to Chelsea, Chelsea Beckford Proxy. Chelsea is a second year student midwife based in the UK and her pronouns are she and her. She is the co-chair of her university's midwifery society and a hypnobirthing practitioner and anti-racism educator. Chelsea is passionate about maternal health equity and reducing the disproportionate rates of maternal mortality in black and brown women and birthing people. In addition, Chelsea is an advocate for the decolonization of midwifery education in order for more students to develop into culturally competent and actively anti-racist healthcare professionals. And if you've got any questions for Chelsea throughout the session, if you write them in the public chat and we'll collect them at the end. And welcome all to this fantastic presentation. And I'll hand over to you, Chelsea, and I'll give you the rights for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm so, so delighted to have you um, here to listen to my presentation. So I'll just get straight into it. So before I begin, I just want people to know that this for me, I'm just trying to create a safe space for everyone. Um, some of the topics um, may result in people feeling some discomfort. Um, I know and understand that racism is not an easy topic to talk about, um, but at the same time, it's not an easy thing to experience either. Um, this is really important work uh, that I'm very passionate about, um, and we all need to uh, kind of play a part in dismantling these systems that we are um, working and living within. Um, so I just want to thank you again for joining me. So Diane kindly introduced me, so mostly cover, covering most of what's on this slide. Um, I am a mum as well um, and was born in Jamaica, but raised over here in the UK. So a uh, quick kind of run through of what I'll cover. Um, I'll just touch on what decolonization of midwifery education means to me um, and what race and racism have to do with birth work and what it actually means to be anti-racist. So my journey to finding my voice. So this all kind of, for me, this all kind of happened um, last year um, it was during the first um, lockdown here in the uk and it was also around the time of the really horrible um death of george, george floyd um, and just so many other things that were taking place the the rise of the black lives matter movement which kind of spread globally and that kind of awoke something within me um, I attended a local Black Lives Matter protest, which was a really peaceful protest, and I came away just feeling really inspired. Um, and so I kind of rode that wave and decided to contact my university teaching team um, and ask if I could, you know, share some texts that I think would, um, that I think that other students would find helpful in kind of broaching the subject of race and kind of. Um, looking into it and not kind of shying away from it and reading texts from uh, black and brown authors. Um, following this, the, kind of, the conversation kind of went on and I started to share some of my ideas with um, a few of my lecturers as to how, um, but I put forward basically ideas of how our education could reflect the needs of the students um, and also in doing that, addressing the gaps in our education that were potentially standing in our way of becoming culturally competent and safe practitioners. And this um, uh, article that you see the screen grab of is kind of the result of that. Um, and I um, managed to get this published in the Practice in Midwife Journal. Um, it's also open access, so I'm quite happy to share links to this um, article if you want to read it afterwards. So what does decolonization of midwifery education mean? So as this quote says, decolonizing is, describes an academic movement across the universities and other institutions to highlight inequalities resulting from historical colonial influences and to transform and modernize materials. 
Now, the key words in this thing, in, in this quote, are historical colonial influences. Um, and no matter how long ago, you know, you're told, you know, slavery was such a long time ago, and colonialism, you know, such a long time ago, the legacies of these things um, are seen today. Um, and an example of that is um, the Sims Speculum, named after James Marion Sims. And um, as he was kind of uh, developing as uh, an obstetrician, gynecologist, uh, he was able to perfect his techniques on, um, on humans, on enslaved women. And this would have been against, you know, without their consent, he was actually gifted um, these women because they were slaves and seen as property as opposed to people. And so he, you know, he got uh, these instruments named after him. He has the Sims position named after him. And we still use these things. Uh, we still use them today. So what is it that students need? Now, in my opinion, students really need a knowledge of how hist of the history of obstetrics and gynecology and how this can have an impact on, um, on how we practice today. So throughout history, we see that the idea of race and connotations of differences um, ba basically being tantamount to inferiority in the field of medicine. Um, and again, that, that kind of props, crops up with the whole James Marion Sims repeated experimentation on women without the use of analgesia. Um, and that's a key factor without not using analgesia was because he assumed uh, they, there was a, a belief that black people did not feel pain in the same way or as, as white people did. And so that kind of justified the use of the, the non-use of analgesia, I should say. It's really important that student midwives have an, an, an idea, an understanding of the historical context of, of what we're doing today, because it does have, these things do have a kind of transgenerational trauma effect and they can, it's a legacy that kind of lasts because even now you, you still think, you still see um, in modern research that doctors, student doctors, still hold that belief that black people do not feel pain in the same way and that can impact the way that that black and brown bodies are treated i think representation is a really important thing it really matters because for me i am a student midwife um, i'm a mum, but above all else i am also a black woman when learning um learning materials largely largely leaning towards um you know the eurocentric Eurocentric value, Eurocentric um, physicality, and um, are often presented through Eurocentric lens. So when we study the maternal pelvis, we concentrate mainly on the gynecoid, um, um, gynecoid pelvic shape. And this is despite um, pelvic shapes being widely varied between geographical re regions and even within the same populations. So this kind of Eurocentric leaning kind of reinforces the idea that the medical, the care that we are providing is, is more suited to one part of society and not another. Um, and as again, as a, as a black student, um, I value representation. I value seeing the, my educators who, you know, some educators that look like me and, and I hope to be joining a workforce where other midwives look like me as well. I think that our learning should include cultural competency and having a culturally competent caregiver can make all the difference to women who are uh, birthing people who may feel um, isolated in society, who may feel that they're not understood, who may feel that their cultural practices um, are not understood and therefore um, there's, there's misconceptions there, there's a chance of misunderstanding and they're not likely to come forward and ask for help if they feel like they won't be understood. I think it's vitally important that um, midwifery students have an understanding of what racism is and what racism isn't and also how to be actively anti-racist and I'll go into this a little bit more later um, and above all we need a safe space um, to grow um, 
as a student on placement, it's really easy to just um, kind of make yourself small and um, not speak up for fear of, you know, um, being seen as a troublemaker. Um, it's not enough for the women and birthing people in our care for us to just not say anything or not challenge behavior that can be harmful. Um, and that needs to be um, a, a, a safe culture, a safe environment needs to be um, kind of nurtured by our teaching teams and also um, the practitioners that we that we train with. So why do we need to address racism as student midwives? Um, this infographic here is taken from um, the most recent um, Embrace report and it says a lot uh, without having to say very much. The numbers kind of speak for themselves. As a black woman in the UK, I'm currently four times as likely to die during pregnancy, um, um, childbirth and the immediate um, postnatal period as white women are purely because of my ethnicity. Now, um, that is that that's really really triggering to me personally and it's quite scary to think that um but what's scary is that this isn't new um these statistics aren't new these disparities have been ca carrying on for quite some time now and there have been many explanations put forward to try and explain it ranging from poverty barriers to accessing care to um black asian and mixed heritage birthing people being more susceptible to certain illnesses now that being said um i don't feel that just pointing the pointing the blame squarely back at the um the people that are um, at risk of these mortality rates is very helpful um because this kind of blaming the victim behavior kind of evades the real problem or one of the major problems which is addressing um, racism within healthcare and it just kind of gives institutions uh, uh, like a get out of jail free card and so they're not looking inwardly at, inwardly as to how they can improve the care but just kind of put it down to oh you know these bodies are just defective and this is just what happens and um, that's not useful that's not helpful so we can't as long as people f focus on these kind of issues or minimize or dismiss the um the experiences of black and brown birthing people nothing's going to get changed but as student midwives we are in a prime position and as midwives as well we're in a prime position to make positive differences to women and birthing people who are at high risk of mortality now I mentioned about um, racism and what um, what racism is or what it isn't, and how that's really important for for um, for students and for midwives as well. Um, now, racism for me, my interpretation of it um, is racial prejudice. So racial prejudice against people of who have of different skin color to yourselves, but in addition to institutional power. Okay, so that is my definition of racism. And that can kind of come in different ways. It's presented in different ways. So you have overt racism, which a lot of people will kind of instantly think of, the very intentional, obvious, and harmful attitudes and behaviors towards people. But what we really need to break down and what we really need to go against is this is covert racism, which is very concealed, very subtle acts that basically serve to restrict or deny people from ethnic minorities access to certain privileges and benefits. And unfortunately, one of those privileges and benefits, not that it should be a privilege, is healthcare. Um, and it gives the perpetrators an opportunity to gaslight the victim or just deny harm altogether. Again, we go back to, you know, the victim blaming, you know, oh, your body's more likely to be susceptible to certain illnesses. So that's how we can explain this. And that's not right. And um, I've just put at the end there microaggressions. Um, microaggressions are a type of covert racism. And what they are, it's basically a statement or an action um, or that's kind of like you would say it's indirect or very subtle or unintentional discrimination against someone from a marginalized group and i have plenty of examples of, of microaggressions i've experienced um,
being told that I speak very well, um, even though I was born in a country that where English is the first language and I have grown up here speaking English perfectly fine all my life. There was an assumption because of where I'm from or because of what I look like that I couldn't hold a, a conversation, a professional conversation on the telephone. And that was from one of my very first jobs. <laughs> um, I was told that by one of my managers. And another one, a good old favourite, is that you to be told that you are pretty for a black girl, which is the biggest backhanded compliment I think I've, I've ever received in my life, is that I am somehow the exception to the rule. Now, on the surface, you could say that, you know, these people, you know, that it's a compliment. These, these things are compliment. They're not compliments. On the surface, they may not seem so bad um, as being called the N-word, you know which is very overt. Um, but when you experience these things on a daily basis, multiple times throughout the day, they can really have an effect on you. They can chip, chip, chip away at you. And um, it can really result in, um, it could be detrimental to your health, to your mental health, uh, resulting in depression and even trauma. So why is cultural competence important? So we are living in an increasingly multicultural society and cultural competence is really important when delivering um, pregnancy care because it can help reduce barriers of care to women and birthing people. Without it, we would have less of an opportunity to build meaningful relationships and we would basically just coexist with people that we just wouldn't understand and that kind of lack of understanding of different cultures different cultural practices would just give rise to an to increase in chances of misunderstandings and also developing biases um so Cultural competence, um, I love this quote from Sobralski and Katz, cultural competence relies on a strong foundation of knowledge about other cultures. It allows the practitioner to appreciate, understand and empathize with that culture. And as a result, deliver appropriate and effective healthcare through changes in both approach and technique. Now, as midwives, you know, the meaning of the word midwife is to be with women and to have an understanding of that woman and her culture and her family setup um, is really important in how we deliver our care and being sensitive to you know the nuances between different cultures and how um, things work is really really important and uh, women and birthing people will truly appreciate um, th that extra effort that we put into make, taking time to actually educate ourselves about their cultures So what can we do? These are just some things that I think are really important in how we can deliver um, really good care um, and also challenge ourselves when it comes to race and racism. It's to not avoid conversations about race or racism. It will make you feel uncomfortable and, and that's okay. Like, as I said pre at the very beginning, this is not a comfortable, this is not a, a comfortable topic to discuss and, and, but it's part of the process. You need to kind of sit with that discomfort um, in order to really kind of challenge yourself and make changes within. We need to also check our personal biases and we need to keep doing that. You know, if you walk into a room and um, you're caring for somebody who is from a different culture to yours, do you feel uneasy? Do you feel uneasy with that? And then ask yourself, why is that? What makes me feel uneasy and how can I change that? How can I change the way I communicate? How can I make this interaction both easier for the person that I'm caring for and also for myself? How can I deliver the best possible care? Another one is to not get defensive or to center yourself. Um, now, I want, I'm going to use the phrase white fragility uh, in a very general sense. What the, the focus is on the fragility part. And so if someone brings up race or if someone brings up the, this topic that you shouldn't just shirk away from it and say, you know, well, I don't do that. I, I don't do those things, you know, just for fear. Because what it is, is you're just kind of retreating back to your place of comfort when really you need to kind of push through that. and 
putting yourself at the center, you know, to say how you feel about these things is not really going to push forward. It's not going to keep the momentum of these kind of conversations going. Actively listening to the experiences of black, Asian and ethnic minority women and birthing people is really, really important because you will gain so much understanding for their lived experience, um, which, you know, sometimes they feel like they're not being listened to and for you to take the time to actively listen to ask the right questions um, and then get to the to the crux of how you can actually improve things um, can go a really really long way so recognizing privilege now using i'm using the word privilege by using this word i'm not referring to i'm not making any assumptions that people have not had to work for what they have achieved i'm not making any assumptions of what you know how much money you have in the bank or anything like that privilege for me is not your life not being made harder when we talk about white privileges your life is not made harder because of your whiteness or your proximity to whiteness whereas my life in certain situations being black is made more difficult is made more awkward because of the fact that purely because of the fact that i'm black that's what i'm alluding to but you can turn that on its head and you can actually use it for good if you know you know a colleague of yours or um, someone in your care is not being listened to you in your position of privilege can advocate for them you can speak up for them and it could be the case that you can open doors that they can't so always use your privilege for good a big one a big um, faux pas of mine is people claiming to be colorblind and I know it usually comes from a place of um, goodwill. It's not usually meant um, to, to be harmful. But in saying that, what it actually does is it kind of negates the cultural values and um, norms and experiences of people of color. So you denying the existence of their race is also denying their experience of a person, um, um, which isn't helpful. Don't be afraid to get things wrong. It will happen, but what really matters is how we learn from our mistakes. We don't learn things from always getting things right. We learn from the things that we get wrong and improving on them. So, you know, having someone challenging you or someone kind of educating you is not um, a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. And we should also always just keep pushing forward. And remembering that being non-racist is not enough now. We're at the point where um, being not racist is actually quite passive. You can say, oh yeah, I'm not racist, and then that's it. That's not enough. We must now be actively anti-racist. So what does being anti-racist mean? Um, so this is a brilliant quote uh, by Ibram X. Kendi, um, by a book that I highly recommend called How to Be an Anti-Racist. To be anti-racist is to think nothing is behaviorally wrong or right inferior or superior with any of the racial groups. Whenever the anti-racist sees individuals behaving positively or negatively, the anti-racist sees exactly that, individuals behaving positively or negatively, not representatives of whole races. To be anti-racist is to de-racialize behavior, to remove the tattooed stereotype from every racialized body. Behavior is something that humans do, not races do. And I think that's an incredibly powerful um, empower, uh, powerful quote. Anti-racism requires continuous action. Um, sorry, um, sorry, I just dropped my microphone. Um, it, it means that um, it will, there will be parts of this journey that you will feel uncomfortable. And moving through this journey, you will pass through different uh, um, different zones almost. So you'll have the fear zone where you will avoid these kind of conversations. You want to be comfortable. So you kind of just deny that these things are happening around you. Then the learning zone follows that. So you recognize your privilege. You're educating yourself on structural racism. And you're also challenging your own biases. And then you move through the growth phase, which is kind of like a infinite really because then you start ad actively advocating for anti-racist policies you're speaking up when you hear or see racism and you don't let mistakes hold you back or um or stop your work so it's continual to continual thing so are you ready to be an ally an anti-racist ally 
in order to do this, um, education is key. I live by the mantra, knowledge is power. And I really do believe, uh, especially in this instance, that that, is, um, that that is really, really important. Don't rely on other people to educate you. Um, there are people willing to do that, um, and uh, but not everybody is willing to do that. It's a lot. It can be a lot of emotional labour um, for some people, particularly people of colour. So find out reading, find out reading materials, find resources. Again, I'm happy to share some of those with you. Speak up. Now, this is a really important one, and it's also a really, really difficult one because I am so anti. I'm really not a confrontational person at all, but. I found that I'm now, I feel like I have to say something, like even if it's just, you know, something that just makes someone stop and think about what they've just said. Uh, it doesn't have to mean a really kind of um, negative interaction. It doesn't have to be uh, any aggress aggression behind it. Something as simple as asking someone, you know, what, what did you mean by that? What did you mean what, when you just said that thing? it can kind of cause someone to stop and think about what they're actually saying. So another way to kind of educate yourself, I guess, is to diversify who you follow on social media, the kind of people that you interact with online, and also through the books that you read. I think for birth workers in particular, um, having an understanding of intersectional feminism is really, really important. My for me, um, femi if feminism is advocating for women's rights and equalities and equality between the sexes, intersectional feminism is the understanding of how kind of overlapping identities can change uh, that experience for somebody. So, for instance, my experience as a cis het woman can be completely different from uh, the experience of a um, Asian trans woman. You know our experiences are very very different and having a kind of sensitivity towards that is is really vital particularly in birth work with regards to how what language we use um and how people identify and um, it's really really important that we have knowledge of that and also doing the work for the right reasons and as i said previously before using privilege for the benefit of not just yourself but for the benefit of others who may not have the means or may not have um, a loud enough voice um, to kind of to, to push doors open. So I would like to invite you um, on the International Day of the Midwife to be the change that you wish to see in the birth world. This work is not easy um, and it's got a long, long way to go. But the more of us that are kind of pitching in, the more of us that are challenging these status quo and the more of us that are kind of shaking tables, um, the better, because um, only good can come of a collective, you know, work towards um, a better way of practicing. So here are some references that I have used. Again, I can share these with you um, if you need to um, following this presentation. Excellent, Chelsea. Thank you very, very much for that wonderful presentation. There are some questions that have come through. If um, it's okay if I ask you, is that okay? Yeah, sure. So, Renee is asking, from a birthing perspective, do you have a top three books you might recommend reading to further intersectional feminism understanding? Um, so they're not exactly birth specific, but um, a couple of books just off the top of my head. Um, one um, is called Hood Feminism. Um, and another is, um, is The Killing of the uh, Black Body. Again, I can kind of put these in an email or something like that if you wanted me to send those on to you. Just pop your email in the chat and I will make sure that I contact you with that. But they're the two that kind of jump jump, um, jump out at me. Excellent. Fantastic. We can um, add that to your presentation when it gets published um, on the internet as well for those. Yeah. Um, so another question that's come through 
is Deepa says, as a mature student midwife, I still find it difficult to question unnecessary remarks that make me feel really uncomfortable. And it does take courage and I will try using um, what do you mean by that? Um, I know you had some other ideas there as well, Chelsea, about how people could navigate as a student or a midwife uh, when, when they feel it's time to speak up. What kind of things can they do and how can they approach that with colleagues? Yes, I, I totally um, agree with that. Like, it is very hard sometimes to kind of find that moment where especially in the heat of things and uh, you kind of think, oh, no, do I let that slide or not? Um, but if you feel uncomfortable enough with what's been said, I think, I know it takes a lot of courage because it's something personally I've had to work on a lot. I wouldn't say boo to a goose to a goose when I first started my studies, um, but confidence kind of comes. Um, and yeah, so asking simple questions like, um, you know, what do you mean by that? Or um, or even just saying, you know, I'm I'm really not comfortable with that, what you just said. Um, um, it can be really, really difficult, but it doesn't always have to be in a, like a really confrontational space. And if you're not, you know, feeling up to actually saying it to that person directly, you know, going to the midwife in charge or um, going to um, one of your link lecturers, um, something like that to discuss it with as well, they can also kind of guide you but it is really scary and I totally appreciate that but it's not really it's not always um, as easy as just going up to someone and and um, starting a conversation but there are people there who will definitely support you fantastic thanks very much Chelsea that's great I had a, another question that came in from Rena, and that was do you feel there should be a movement within midwifery or medicine to stop using procedure names that are based on racist people who discovered the procedure, such as the Sims position, for example. Should we all be referring to this as an exaggerated side lying rather than Sims? Uh, thank you for that, Rena. Um, uh, personally, yes, I do think that we should move away from um, from from those kind of from using the names of those people. Now, I, I know probably not, maybe not everyone will agree with me, but um, you know, I feel like my stomach actually turns whenever someone tells me to go and get a sim speculum or you know, you know, putting someone in a sims position. It really makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but at the time, you know, you're giving care to somebody else, so you can't really think about it. But um, you know, what about, you know, honouring the women that he experimented on, essentially? We don't hear about that. We don't see that. So why should he um, get the honour of us, you know, naming things after him? That is a really, really, really good point. Um, we also have some other questions that are there any other organisations that are looking to investigate this issue or social media threads that you can recommend at all, Chelsea, that you want to point um, anybody in the direction of? Uh, yes, um, there is the um, Five Times More in the UK, there's uh, the Five Times More campaign, um, which um, recently they, they launched a government petition, which was, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, that actually got um, debated in Parliament. Um, and what they're now give on off the back of that, there's going to be more kind of research into why there is this disparity with uh, maternal mortality rates in the UK, and also looking into not just the mortality rates, but also um, the near misses, which were not included in any kind of report. So to have a clearer picture of how care actually varies between you know women of different ethnicities so that's going to be really interesting development to watch out for um, and also um, the organization birth birthrights.org um, they're also gathering um, exp lived experiences from um, women and healthcare professionals who identify as being black asian or, or of mixed heritage just to get a really clearer picture of both sides of um, you know the actual maternity care workers and women and birthing people in their care 
So those are two that I would really look into, birth rights and also five times more. I'm not sure whether you'd be able to watch the parliamentary debate. I'm not sure if that's, it could be recorded somewhere. I'll try and find a link for it. But it was, um, it was really, really, really inspiring, but also quite disappointing right at the end. Um, but if I can find a link for you, it would be a really good thing to watch. Um, um, members, actual members of parliament who had really poor experiences, you know, sharing those experiences and um, really putting in quite a lot of emotional labour into sharing those experiences with, with the House. Um, so it was a really good um, report, um, debate to watch. Excellent. We've had a really um, interesting point coming from Emily as well. And she says, thank you so much. This is such an important topic. Um, among many other areas, we need to make a fresh look at education, both through school and professional trainings, including midwifery, to change the normalisation of covert racism in society. And so frequently in healthcare and in international development, covert unintentional racism reinforces the white male supremacy principle. And I know you had some thoughts on this yourself, Chelsea, about kind of suggestions that students can do independently to kind of try and bring about changes in their learning and in their learning environment and also how their programmes are taught. If you want to talk to us a little bit about that more, Chelsea, that would be fantastic. Yes, thanks, Diane. Um, Emily, that's a really, really great point because let's not forget that midwifery was, you know, elder um, wise women who knew who had that knowledge of the birthing process of the physiological birthing process who were basically kind of elbowed out of the way by male doctors <laughs> um, so I, I completely understand that point um, and I think we do need to kind of go back to that we need to go back to trusting women's bodies and not pathologizing birth so much but with them um, the point um, question Diane raises what students can actively do um, to kind of bring about changes in their own learning. So I, um, as part of my uni's uh, midwifery society, I'm trying to organise different kinds of events. We're in the process now of organising an inclusion event um, and bringing in different speakers who will kind of share knowledge and understanding of topics that aren't covered in our you know, normal curriculum. Um, flag up any events and get your teaching teams to share these things um, via, you know, you know, sending out emails, flagging up events, seminars, talks with members of your cohorts. Um, as I did, I shared some reading lists and that kind of got conversations going with different students in my cohort as well. Um, and also, if you have the opportunity giving feedback on your, on your actual course, giving feedback, we've recently had um, had an opportunity to input on what we would like to see our new curriculum looking like at my um, university so if you get ever get a chance to do that kind of go all out like have your points ready and just um yeah let them know what what things that you feel are missing because i feel it's kind of a disservice to students to kind of kind of have these three years and then at the end of it, you actually feel like, oh my gosh, there's still there's so much that I don't get and that I don't understand. When there is plenty of opportunity to kind of put these kind of things in place, like having a workshop on um, um, female genital cutting, for example, having um, an event that centres on um, the LGBTQ community, like all these kind of things can be really, really helpful to our learning, but we're missing out on. Um, and I think it's it's um, sometimes it is up to the students to kind of shake tables and make a bit of noise about it. Yes. Oh, you're on mute, Diane. Are you there, Diane? Sorry, sorry, Chelsea. Oh, it was me. I thought I had my mic on. Um, thank you very much for that. I know um, a couple of people were really keen to get the titles of those books that you mentioned again. Are you able to write them in the public chat there? Yes, or sure. just say, say them again so everyone can note them down that wants them? 
Does anybody have a question they want to ask at all, Chelsea, in person? Just raise your hand or any more questions in the public chat, that's fine. Everyone's really pleased for the topic here today, Chelsea. Oh, I'm really pleased. And they're all really enjoying um, the information that you're sharing as well. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Is there anything further you want to add at all, Chelsea? You've got another five minutes or so. Oh, have I? Oh, my goodness. I really raced through that. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to run out of time. Um, just to say that I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone that's attended the session. And, um, oh, Celine, yes. Um, so I'm just looking through the chat. But, yeah, midwives should be feminists, uh, definitely. Um, and I just hope that this kind of talk has really inspired you to talk to colleagues or talk to other members of your cohorts if you're a student um, and then bring about change. If there's something that's not quite right, it's one thing I've learned, if, if there's something that you feel is missing, uh, sometimes it is really scary to kind of put your hand up and say, but I took that kind of risk and put my hand up and said, you know, I think we need to add this and I think this is missing and it's kind of really helped me to grow um, as an activist um, and as a student as well and really helped with me just being more of an advocate for things that I really believe in. So it's really hard sometimes and um, it can feel like you're uh, going to be the odd one out or you know, the one that always brings up race but for me it's really important and I'll, I will never not do it and I'll never not um, stop talking about it. I've never not talked about it. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chelsea. I'll just have one quick more check, see if anyone wants to ask any more questions. Uh, just everyone saying thank you so much. Juliet saying there, thank you for having the courage to present this, Chelsea. It has oh, been really you. helpful. Fabulous. And Grace saying there, thank you very much. <laughs>